Good evening and welcome to Greater Somerville for November 29th, 2016. I'm Joe Lynch. My guest tonight is the multi-term newly re-elected state representative in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts from the 27th Middlesex District, Denise Provo. It is my pleasure to welcome her back to Greater Somerville and back to SCAT TV. Thank you, Joe. You're, you're, you're a multi-performer here at SCAT TV. You come to our annual meetings, you do promos for us, you are on talk shows, you're interviewed by uh, Somerville Neighborhood News. It's a good thing you don't have multiple cities. It sure is. Yeah. Well, Somerville, even the 11 precincts of Somerville, which I represent, are a handful. Well, plenty of people, plenty of human need. Before we go into that human need, before we go into uh, accomplishments in this se session, congratulations from Thank us you. here at SCAT TV. You've been a terrific supporter of our endeavor down here and our mission, so congratulations on re-election. Thank you very much. Yeah. So what's going on at the State House last year? What's going on next year? In 27 minutes, can you, can you give us that Ooh. encapsulation? Uh, well, in, in the last session, you know, there were some some of the usual things, two budgets in a two-year session. Um, we did a, a big energy bill at the end of the session, um, mm -hmm. which was mostly good. And um, as it, you know, we're, we're still in informal session twice a week. We won't see any big bills probably unless there's some uh, negotiated compromises on some of the legislation that didn't make it through by the end of the formal sessions at the end of July, um, which could happen, um, you know, for, for, for those what you might call big ticket items. Right. Um, that's really in the hands of, of some of the top negotiators between, between the Senate and the House. Uh, for the rest of us, a lot of what we're doing, besides trying to get little bills through in the informal sessions, including home rule petitions, um, is planning our legislative agenda for the next session and, um, and working on sort of big non-legislative items, like making sure the Green Line continues to happen. Uh, How many times have we talked about that on this show? Oh. Making sure that the green line is going to oh. come. We'll get into it a little bit more, a little bit more in depth. But quite frankly, you know, I, I want to go back to one thing that you said during the campaign. Mm -hmm. And you and I did not have contact during the campaign. Um, m many of the folks out there know that you live probably about a stone's throw away from me. We have been friends. Blocks. So in the interest of, you know, avoiding any conflict of interest, Andy Metzger from State House News interviewed you during the re-election campaign. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I found interesting that Andy asked you was, in the years that you have been at the State House, you have not been given a chairmanship for any of those um, committees that you serve on. And I thought it was a terrific answer that you gave him. He, he, it was kind of one of those fishing questions, mm -hmm. as only good reporters can, can give. Um, and your response to him was, those who oppose the leadership for certain specific issues mm -hmm. are not rewarded with the leadership positions. Mm -hmm. And Andy's follow-up question to you was, well, why do you think that is? And, and I'm going to paraphrase here. Don't get mad. <laughs> Denise Provo had nothing to do with this. You basically said, well, I don't do a whole lot of bum kissing up there. I, I'm an independent when it comes yeah. to what's right and wrong. So I just want, I wanted to make mention of that because several people called me and said, how come you didn't interview Denise Provo oh, okay. during the election? And I thought, you know, so people were paying attention. Let's move into one of the, also one of the things that you said in that Andy Metzger interview was that one of your proudest accomplishments last year was the... LGBTQ legislation that you had passed. Oh, the, yeah, the, um, the full legal equality for transgender people. For that transgender. One. Yep. Yeah. Terrific. Congratulations Thank on you. that, by the way. Thank you. Um, and one of, the things, one of the things in the news today, I just want to mention it. I'll let you go on. 
Thank you for not getting arrested today uh, for the sit down in the middle of Mass Ave. I know there was a state senator that was uh, taken away. Yes. Over in Cambridge. It wasn't, it wasn't Senator Jalen, so she's, she's safe. Um, so go back to your other accomplishments during the year last year. You had some terrific successes. Yes. Um, and one of those was with the energy bill, um, was getting an amendment that's going to require um, gas leaks, um, as in the natural gas distribution system that's under all of our city streets, to, to be repaired based on, on their impact. Right now, the law only requires that gas leaks be repaired if they're close to buildings and pose the risk of um, an explosion in the building, which is important and good. But um, you know, there's been there's been mapping done within the last couple of years in in the urban core that shows where the gas leaks are and how severe they are. And Somerville has very leaky ga natural gas infrastructure. Right. Right. And the problem with that is we're paying for it. The, we're paying for the leaks. The distribution company charges us sure. for all the gas that's going up into the atmosphere. Sure. Meanwhile, um, you know, raising the temperature of the atmosphere because uh, it's, natural gas is practically pure methane. So right now in Somerville, and Cambridge too, although their leaks aren't as bad as ours, um, we emit as much greenhouse gas from leaky infrastructure as we do through all of the automobiles that we've got on the road. It's interesting that you mention it because uh, last winter, I think it was last winter or the winter before, we had a major gas leak on my little street, mm -hmm. which is 14 feet wide. And it was amazing to me how quickly uh, NSTAR, was it NSTAR? It would have been. It could have been, yeah. Source um, or NSTAR. Um, how quickly they got there, but how difficult it was for them to find that leak. Yeah. And then you, one of the technicians that was there, it happened right out in front of my house, said they had no idea how old those gas lines were because there had been no records kept when they were installed. I'm, I'm sure that's true. Um, we do have very old infrastructure here. We also have more than one provider. Right. Um, um, Eversource, as they mm -hmm. call themselves now, has some of the city uh, national grid supplies natural gas to other parts of the city. Right. And um, actually, if you if you look at the the maps and the the acronym for the the organization mm -hmm. that that did the mapping is HEAT, H-E-E-T. It's Home Energy Efficiency Team. Um, and you can find the maps online. Uh, but the, you know, the, the bigger the leak, the higher the peak on the map. They're sort of have a three-dimensional look. And the northern part of Somerville is referred to as the Somerville Alps by those who make and, and keep the, the maps because the Amazing. The, the number of the leaks and the, and the volume now, do you that they're think, emitting. Do you think some of that's going to change once, you know, in areas where Somerville is undergoing massive, um, I don't want to call it gentrification, massive redevelopment, such as Union Square, Assembly Square, parts of other parts of the city, are they going to be required to change over those gas well, lines? Well, it could. My, my colleague, Representative Ehrlich from Marblehead, um, got an amendment into the bill that says that whenever a street is opened for any purpose, whether it's, you know, water mains or drains or repaving, whatever, whenever a street is opened, that the gas, natural gas distribution company has to come and check for leaks and repair them. Um, but there, there are some requirements in there, for instance, that the municipality give six months advance notice to the yeah, gas good, supplier. Good luck with that. It's, well, that's, that's the kind of thing I would be concerned about is that the, the administrative um, procedures right. are in place to make right. sure that whenever there, there are plans to open a road that, that you get word out in time. And of course, it wouldn't uh, apply to emergency street openings either. And that's the vast majority of what we have in Somerville with an old system, old water and sewer. The vast majority that I see, anyway, yeah. 
or because of breaks or leaks. Mm -hmm. So they're constantly repairing. I know the mayor has a big initiative. You know, that's why we've got the $60 charge that I hate on my water bill. Um, but there's a big initiative coming up to, to uh, work in tandem with emergency repairs versus repairing the old and aging infrastructure. And I think it's like a five-year plan or an eight-year plan here in the city. But let's go on to some other things in the environmental. You're a fierce environmental advocate. You always have been. Um, ever since I've known you on the days of the Board of Aldermen, uh, Representative Provo was, for those of you who don't know, she was an alderman at large. Mm -hmm. And this is kind of a tricky kind of question, so let me just say, you appeared at Somerville City Hall, the Alderman's Chamber, in you were giving testimony in terms of an environmental, semi-environmental issue here in the city of Somerville, which is synthetic turf or real grass in the ball fields and the playgrounds of Somerville. And your purpose of being there was that the state still owns three hefty pieces, chunks of land here in the city. And can you talk a little bit about that? Because I did get a call, one or two calls, about why would the state rep be weighing in on that? Well, uh, you know, at the, at the time that I, I went to testify, the, the final fields plan, which had been distributed to the aldermen, wasn't even available online yet. There were earlier iterations. But I knew that, um, that part of the city's plan is to put turf fields on in DCR parks. S synthetic or, or synthetic, 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 yep. synthetic turf fields. And, and there is one now, you know, back in, what was it, 2004 when the state rebuilt uh, Dillboy Stadium. With Shannon Stadium, yep. Right. Um, that, that was, um, uh, the Commonwealth spent $8 million putting in a, a turf field and some other amenities, you know, they put in the new bleachers as well. <laughs> So I'm not saying the whole eight million was the field, but um, you know, you, it's true that it's an environmental issue. But I was coming at it very much from from a, a cost perspective, because you know, when the plan did go online and I was able to look at it, there's no capital plan for installing these fields, and I wanted to be sure that the aldermen knew, with respect to the DCR fields, that it's DCR's policy that if, if it allows the installation of a turf field on its property, and it sometimes does if it's a high usage mm -hmm. area, it requires some other party to pay the initial capital cost and, and the then the maintenance, maintenance and right. the ongoing maintenance. Right. And a remarkable number of people didn't hear that part of my testimony, which was the, the principal so part. So that was one of the reasons why I wanted to bring that up tonight. I mean, it, it's an environmental issue. You know, there were all kinds of testimony at that, that hearing about the master plan for the parks mm -hmm. in the city of Somerville. You know, people are talking about drainage and they're talking about soil contamination. And I know there's pros and cons, but you, the real reason you were there was to kind of raise the flag to the Board of Aldermen saying, if you choose to go the path on the DCR property, you have to pay for it and you have to come up with a maintenance plan and ongoing costs of this thing. Well, you know, there, I had had conversations in the building, actually all of the agencies within the Executive Office of Energy and Environment um, came into the State House this fall to, to outline their their missions and their policies and make themselves available and you know for, for questions and whatnot so it, it was very helpful right. um, but it was also you know it was also a very clear part of of their message within DCR that um, that if if they allow for turf fields, that it's at the expense of some other party. And recently, recently they did that. Um, Daly Field in Brighton is a DCR park, which um, and who wound up paying for it though? Uh, was Simmons, it a private party? Simmons College. Simmons College paid um, for it. In yeah. fact, in fact, the legislature had to vote on that because unlike um, Dilboy, which is just a management agreement between DCR and the city, Simmons is actually leased. Um, the field. So it was a leasehold improvement that they did to the field 
ongoing maintenance is their responsibility. Right. No, well, uh, right, but Simmons paid the capital cost, capital, which was yeah. $7.7 .7 million. They're expensive fields. Yes. Yeah. And, um, and, you know, as as well as take, taking on, uh, you know, something I hadn't realized about the artificial turf fields is they have something called a, a membrane underneath that needs to be replaced every 10 years sure, at, at a cost of about half a million dollars. Um, and evidently there are also disposal costs because you can't just send them to any right. landfill. And this plan doesn't really talk about any any of those features. Um, admittedly, it is phased in over time. Um, so the main but, purpose really, Denise, was you, you were talking about the green that it's going to cost to keep the green on the well, artificial turf. Yes, because since DCR is a state agency, you know, people come to right. the, the legislative delegation right. and say, can't you talk some sense into right. DCR, or can't you get DCR to do this? Well, speaking of, of talking sense into a state agency, let's move on to another subject that is okay. green, the yes. green line. Yes. We went to another hearing, another public hearing, um, that was recently about, I don't know if you went to it, because I watched the replay. It was about the city of Somerville contributing $50 million. No, I, I was not at that hearing. And it was overwhelmingly in support of. Mm -hmm. There were some people who were, um, this is my term, not Representative Provost, Johnny come lately, is they didn't realize that we've been doing this for the last 16 years here in the city. You and I met over a Green Line meeting. Um, so we're at the point now where I think the Board of Aldermen are going to vote yes to contribute the $50 million towards the Green Line. What's the sense, though, that you're getting, um, considering the recent presidential election, we have a Republican governor, what, but we still have um, Congressman Capuano who fights for this to try to keep it mm -hmm. on the table. Is your sense that it is still going to get built in a much more pared down fashion, but it will get built? It would seem so. Um, the process has been very slow, but Recently, within the last five or six weeks, uh, a new manager for the project was appointed, John Dalton. I saw I, that. Yes, yeah. and um, and the fact that that he has been hired suggests that the administration is committed to keeping the project going. Um, you probably saw a letter that Federal Transit Administration sent to the administration mm -hmm. a, a few months before that, which um, the heart, at the heart of which was, was the New Starts grant, which the city hopes to get, the city, the, the Commonwealth hopes to get for, for the scaled down project. And you know, it was a hopeful letter. It suggested that, you know, since the scope of the project was essentially the same, that that was a favorable thing, but one of the specific things that FTA asked for was that the Commonwealth staff the project, and um, and the appointment of Mr. Dalton is is the first such staffing move. Who, if I remember correctly, his his um, credentials are stellar when it comes to huge management projects like this. They they would seem to be. Yeah. Uh, well, let's keep be. our fingers crossed yes. because, as I've joked with you before and, and other elected officials, I'll be living at the VNA by the time they open up Lowell Street. So I'd like to be able to just walk across onto the path over to the Green Line stop so I can get into town. Mm -hmm. um, some other initiatives that are coming up. We probably have about 10 minutes left here well, on the I show. Do, I do want to mention that sure. there, there is, um, on December 7th, there's going to be another public meeting on the Green Line extension at the high school, I believe. Okay. Um, so once again, I expect that the, the people of Somerville, um, who, have, who have been asked to wait for so very long, will be, will be turning up and saying, Yes, we still want the Green Line extension. You know, I joke about it. After all I, those years. I joke about it, but you, I think it was you, uh, President of the Board, Bill, uh, Bill White, Board of Aldermen, Bill White, myself, um, Wig Zamor, Barbara Rubel from Tufts University. There were multiple people who were on that first advisory committee in 2005. 
Isn't that amazing? Oh, yes. 2005. Yeah. We used to meet at the VNA. Speaking of the one VNA. of that was one of yeah. the places. Yes. So you've got some uh, you've got some new initiatives coming up for for 2017. Before I go any further, speaking of elected officials, I, I just wanted to kind of get this is not a gotcha if you choose not to answer it. Um, I wanted to get your opinion. Um, the former Speaker of the House, Sal DeMacy, mm -hmm. was released on compassionate release uh, based on the fact that he is. Um, uh, second time around in remission on cancer and had a very short period to serve in his sentence on the corruption charges. What was your feeling about that, the co compassionate release? Um, compassion. Um, compassion. I've, I've seen photographs of him. He looks terrible. Um, you know, um, our colleague representative to me has a bill in the legislature which he, he filed this session that would allow more broadly for compassionate relief of the elderly and terminally ill mm -hmm. in our prison system. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I, I think it makes sense to go in that direction for, for a lot of reasons. Yeah. I, uh, I, I tend to agree with you. But speaking of, speaking of Representative Toomey, Yes. Um, you'll be saying goodbye to Representative Toomey at the State House, but you'll be so. welcoming a new uh, state rep yep. representing part of Somerville, Mike Connolly. Yep. One in his second bid for the uh, District 26th. I think it's the 26th. 26th representative district. So um, working together with uh, Representative Barber and Senator Jalen and next year Mike Connolly, what's on the plate coming forward? Well, I. I as far as the delegation. Or so, bills, your own bills. Oh, well, my own bills. Um, you know, a, an array of, um, you know, bills I've, I've filed in past years. And, uh, you know, it's, it's unusual for a bill to get adopted the first session. Although that, it did, I, I was able to do it once, but, you know, it's, uh, usually have to keep refiling a bill right. and building consensus around it. But, you know, I got an email today from a constituent saying that the homestead exemption, which is, is the amount of, um, of assets in, in your, your, your real estate, which is your principal home, mm -hmm. that, that you can protect against creditors, yep. um, that it was last raised in 2011, and it's $500,000. And is that adequate given what's happened to real estate prices? And I'm thinking, no, I don't think it is anymore. And I think. But would they have to do that statewide, or can they yeah. do that oh, yeah. district by district? No, that, that's, it's, it's, um, it's a sort of thing that's appropriate to do statewide. New York State evidently has a $750,000 homestead exemption given. Um, home prices in well, sure. Massachusetts. I think, I think it makes all the sense in the world. I, that's just, you know, basic consumer protection. Sure. One small 900 square foot condo in Boston is 500,000 plus. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we certainly, I don't, I don't know that we've seen the end of it. We certainly still have a lot of demand for housing chasing, not enough supply. So, um, so, you know, that's a, a good example of, of the kind of bill that, that comes to me because um, a constituent is, you know, thinking about things and makes a suggestion. So. I did forget one. Excuse me for a minute. Sure. I forgot another one of one that you should be, you know, hurting your elbow to pat yourself on the back is the lowering of the speed limits. That, yeah, that's, that's right. one that that, was, that is a bill that you introduced probably back in 2007. 2007. 2007. 2007. And you were trying to work on that when you were uh, bo on the board of aldermen, trying yes. to get the speed yes. limit lowered in the city, right? So congratulations on that. I know there are some people at home who do, who say that's fine and dandy. You just made the sign maker wealthy because they'll switch over the signs, but it comes down to enforcement. It does come down to enforcement, and it has nothing to do with signs because the speed limit that's been changed is the unless otherwise posted right. speed limit. What right. is what is the, which is the maximum s speed in places 
where the speed limit isn't posted. Mm -hmm. So, um, how do out of staters know that? How that is a good question. That is a good question. Um, so, if my nephew in New York, who drives crazy anyway, uh, comes back to Massachusetts all of a sudden or into Somerville all of a sudden and he thinks it's 35, are they going to give him a warning or are they going to give him a ticket? That, you know, that's, that's a better question for the chief than it is for me. Enforcement is not my department. I would think, especially when a law is new and people are just getting used to it, you start off with, with warnings. warnings. Yeah. Uh, that certainly, that was certainly what the state did when they, they changed the rule for pulling aside for emergency vehicles. Um, and, you know, this is, I think, Somerville is still the only municipality that has opted to adopt the lower speed limit. The lower limit. speed limit, though, I did see something in one of the publications in Cambridge that Cambridge is also considering. Cambridge has wanted. Cambridge, Newton, Boston Brooklyn. has too. Boston, yeah. the, in, in fact, under under the last two mayors of Boston, lowering the speed limit has always been one of the mayor's priority bills. I've probably worked more closely with Boston on this bill than I than I did with Somerville. But Somerville's been behind it, as you say, since I was on the board of aldermen. You know, in a, in a very densely congested city like Somerville, it makes so much sense. Mm -hmm. You know, it may not make sense in certain parts of the western part of the state, but it certainly makes sense in our city. So I wanted to thank you for yeah. that. But. Oh, you're, you're very welcome. You're very welcome. So I'm sorry, I interrupted because I didn't want you to go away not getting that little pat in the back about okay. the 25 speed limit. I'm going to take a look at the clock here and we have about a minute and a half left. Okay. So coming up next year, um, you'll take the oath again in January. Uh, first Wednesday in January. First Wednesday in January. And um, State House office, are you still in the boiler room? I'm not in the boiler <laughs> I'm, I'm I ha I, 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 <coughs> My office, it's on the fourth floor. I look out onto um, the red bricks of, of Beacon Hill and the sky and trees, and I've got lots of sunlight. Um, so offices don't usually change until March, right. if they change. Right. I've, kept, I've kept this office for the last three sessions. And constituents can come up and see you? Call, your, call your legislative aide, make an appointment? Absolutely, or you. I meet people in district all the right. time. You right. know, who, who could afford a district office? I, I surely could not. Maybe but, you can go halves with Dennis Sullivan when he <laughs> sets up his sidewalk table. Well, you know, we, there, there are, fortunately there are restaurants and cafes all over the city and, um, you know, we rent tables that's by great, the... That's a terrific idea. Meet your state rep in a sidewalk cafe and rent a table for a day. <laughs> Denise, I want to thank you. Oh, thank you, Joe. Congratulations again on Thanks the re-election. My guest has been State Representative Denise Provo. As always, stay safe, stay informed. See you next time. Good night. Good night.